John chapter 7. Okay, so let me just first set the scene here. Um, the scene is we're going to the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Feast of Tabernacles goes on for seven days. And the celebration is really about honoring their ancestors, the Israelites, the Jews, honoring their ancestors that did spend 40 years wandering the desert um, under Moses. And so, so this, those three major feasts that happen every year, and every man, every Jewish man over the age of 21 must attend, is the Passover, the Pentecost, and the Tabernacles. And so let me just read to, so, so we need to understand what's going on here. So first I'm going to read to you what the Sukkot, Sukkot is about, according to the Jewish library. Then we're going to read in the Jewish library about what, what the Bible was in the days of Jesus. What did they have available to them? And then the, and then the scene opens up where um, I believe it is a foreshadow of the second coming. So what John 7 is about is Jesus is going to arrive in Jerusalem, um, not on time. He's going to be late. He's going to come in secret. He, and he's going he's to go straight into the temple and he's going to start teaching his doctrine from his father. And there's going to be complaining. There's going to be murmuring going on. And there's going to be a division. And there's going to be an attack by the Pharisees and accusations by the Pharisees. And so there's this constant, basically, Jesus calling out the Pharisees, the religious religious leaders of the day, he's calling them out. He's saying, look, you're teaching on the law and you don't even know the law. So Jesus just turns everything they say upside down. I just want to point out here, Jesus never once um, said, hey, you better listen to your Pharisees and Sadducees. Never once did he say, listen to your religious leaders. I think that's really important, guys, to understand that. He always said, go into the Bible with the Holy Spirit and get, that's what John 7 is about, okay? Jesus is bringing about a turning over of the law. Uh, don't, we don't, no more law, all right? It's about the Holy Spirit. Once you understand that almost all of Jesus, all of his teachings is talking about once I die, once I ascend into my glorified body, the Holy Spirit is going to be available to every man, woman, and child. Okay, it wasn't that way in the Old Testament, Right in the Old Testament, God did send Holy Spirit, right to Moses in Exodus, to Joseph in Genesis, to Joshua in Deuteronomy, to various judges and kings, to Saul and and, and, and to David. Okay, so the Holy Spirit arrived at times, according to God's will. You know, God would send His Holy Spirit to certain people in the Old Testament. So what we're doing is we're laying down. Jesus is laying down groundwork that there was going to be this thing called the Holy Spirit, known as living waters, known as bread of life. He always, he always takes everyday language to describe the Holy Spirit. And you're going to hear that as in waters and bread, also his blood and flesh. And so that's, that's the, I just wanted to lay, so we, we come at this with a perspective of, this is also, you can see here as a foreshadow of the second coming. So Jesus knows in his first arrival, he's not going to be accepted. He's going to be denied. He's going to be accused. He's going to be attacked. He's going to be killed. He's going to resurrect. And he knows his second coming is going to happen in which the Jews will be the same way. That's basically what the groundwork is. So as I read it, I'll stop and just, we'll just kind of feel that, that, you know, put ourselves tangibly there in those days because, um, you know, those days are back and there's no sound doctrine today. If you're not just reading verbatim the verses and you're listening to somebody else's interpretation, get away from that. Read the verses. That's why um, you don't really see anybody reading just every single verse because most of John's chapters are long. You know, they're most of over 50 verses, but I'm going to go. I'm not going to skip any verses. I'm not going to do that. So, okay. Go into the Jewish library and let's understand what, what this Feast of Tabernacles is. All right, here's what it says. In honor of the holiday's historical significance, we are commanded to dwell in temporary shelters as our ancestors did in the wilderness. The commandment to dwell in a Sukkot can be fulfilled by simply eating all of one's meals there. However, if the weather, climate, and one's health permit, one should live in a Sukkah, Sukkot, 
as much as possible, including sleeping in it. A suit coat must have at least three walls covered with material that will not blow away in the wind. Canvas covering tied or nailed down is acceptable and quite common in the United States. A suit coat may be any size so long as large enough for you to fulfill the commandment of dwelling in it. The roof of a suit coat must be made of material referred to as uh, sekak, means covering, to fulfill the commandment. The covering must be something that grew from the ground and was cut off, such as tree branches, corn stalks, bamboo reeds, sticks, or two by fours. A sekak must be, or covering must be left loose, not tied together, or tied down. It must be placed sparsely enough that rain can get in, preferably sparsely enough that the stars can be seen, but not so sparsely that more than 10 inches is open at any point or that there is more light than shade. The covering must be put on last. Okay, it, it goes on for pages about this, this Feast of Tabernacles and, and what the people are required to do. Just know it's in the fall. It's September, October. It's about the harvest. The feasts are all about basically the farming season, right? The, the spring is the seeds and the harvest and so forth. So that's what these feasts are about. And the Sukkot specifically is about honoring their ancestors, remembering their 40 years of wandering around the deserts and how they were provided for by gathering up these materials. So that's what it's about. Now, let me take, because Jesus is going to, in John 7, Jesus is going to walk into the temple and start teaching. So let me, let me take us to what we know is available in that time period. Okay, they had the Septuagint right here, this very Septuagint, the LXX, right here is the one to have, the LXX. This is, this is what they had um, in the days of Jesus' teaching. So let me read that again from the Jewish library, exactly what it says. The Septuagint, LXX, was the first translation of the Hebrew Bible and was made in the 3rd century B.C., by Jewish scribes who were direct descendants of those trained in Ezra's great synagogue of Jerusalem. They were complete experts in the text, being very well versed in Hebrew and Greek. This translation became very popular among Jews in the first two centuries before Christ because many Jews in those days did not understand Hebrew. Their ancestors had left Israel centuries before and generation after generation gradually lost the ability to read the scriptures in Hebrew. Many of the Jews in Jesus' day used the Septuagint as their Bible. Quite naturally, the early Christians also used the Septuagint in their meetings and for personal reading, and many of the New Testament apostles quoted it when they wrote the Gospels of the, and the Epistles in Greek. What is most fascinating is that the order of the books in the Septuagint is the same order in our Bibles today not like the Hebrew scrolls. Jesus and the apostles studied, memorized, used, quoted, and read most often the Bible of their day, the Septuagint. Since Matthew wrote primarily to convince the Jews that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed their promised Messiah, it follows as a matter of course that this gospel is saturated with Hebrew scriptures. Yet when Jesus quotes the Old Testament in Matthew, he uses the Hebrew text 10% of the time and the Greek LXX translation 90% of the time. Okay, so we know, we, we've set the scene. We understand that that there's, again, it's a Feast of Tabernacles. Everyone, every man over 21 is required to be there for seven days. It's a seven-day holiday. So there's tens of thousands, maybe hundred thousand. I don't know how many people are there. Okay, so let's now jump into John 7 and verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. So in Jewry means there's 12 tribes of Israel. There's 12 tribes of Jews, and they're spread throughout Galilee to Jerusalem. And so Jesus is not walking among the Jews. And so you can imagine, it doesn't tell us how far off the, you know, how much he had to circumvent that, but he's not walking in Jewry. He's not... He's not following the Jews. There's a parade going to Jerusalem. So Jesus is in Galilee. Jerusalem's like 90 miles away. As, as I, that's the best I can remember. I looked on a map several days ago about that. But anyways, so he, he's, he's, he's walking around the crowd. People were pilgrimaging towards the temple in Jerusalem. That's where everybody's gathering. Okay, so now we know that the Jews want to kill him. And he's, he's not walking with the Jews. 
John 7, verse 2. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. I already explained that. The Sukkot, that is the Tabernacles. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence, and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou do. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. That's sad. John 7, verse 6, And Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is already here. The world cannot hate you, but me it hates, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. So he's saying right here, the church leaders are evil. The people here are evil. They're, they're teaching lies. They're accusing. It's, it's, all, it's all gone terribly wrong. And verse 8, And go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not full come. I see this here as the foreshadow of the second coming. So his time is not, he's going to come in secret. We're going to read that a little, in a few verses later. He's going to come in secret. And so there's not going to be any announcement of his coming. The people will not see him. He's really giving us a foreshadow of the second coming. That's what's going on here. Because in this, by the time he does arrive at this feast, and we'll, you'll see that through the verses, by the time he does arise, there's, there's shouting, there's accusation, there's murmuring, which means complaining, there's division. There, it, it's going to be the scene that plays out for the Jews when they realize that the first three and a half years in which the Antichrist has arrived on the scene in Jerusalem, by the way, in Jerusalem, the Antichrist right, arrives on the scene. Everybody loves him. Everybody, the whole world loves him. And at some point, they're going to see Jesus Christ, the real Messiah, behind, or I should say above, the Antichrist. Right? Revelation 19, by the time they get to Armageddon, when the Jews see the real thing, um, when the Antichrist is revealed for who he is, and in Revelation we're told, you better flee to the mountain. You better hope it's not winter. You better hope it's not the Sabbath. You better hope you're not, you know, just had a baby. Anyway. That's not for John 7 study, but what I'm getting at here is, is we're, we're establishing the groundwork for what's going to happen thousands of years later. Okay, let's read on. John 7, verse 8, go up. Oh, my time is not full come. So, so verse 9, when he has said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. So he sent them on ahead. But when his brethren were gone up, they then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. So he's probably got some type of cloak on, some type of hat on, right? He's not he's not really revealing himself. He's going he's going to after everybody else has arrived at the feast, now he's coming in as secret. There will be no warning when the second coming of man happens. The rapture will happen first. There will be no no warning for that. And then the second coming of man, it's all over with. You're done for. If you're alive in those days, it's, you'll be devoured. You'll be consumed. There'll be no warning. So we, we need to get into the scripture and understand how, how important it is. If you do not know the scripture, you're not going to be raptured. If you're lukewarm, you're not, if you're just enjoying life and you're not spending some time in the Bible every day, sorry about your luck. Because those days, those last seven years are going to be... The biggest deception that's ever hit the world. Verse 11. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? And there was much murmuring. There was much complaining. These people are constantly complaining. What is wrong with these people? They're stiff-necked and hard-hearted. It tells us about these people in those days, not only the, at the first coming of Jesus, at the second coming as well. They will be stiff-necked and hard-hearted. It's going to be very difficult. So this is a scene, I just want you to know. This is a scene that applies to, to us today like no, other, like no other time. You really, we need to understand this is us today. The division, the, the accusations, the complaining, um, it's, it, that's where we are today, okay? John 7 is, is who and where we are. There was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some said, he is a good man, others say nay, but he deceiveth the people. 
Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. Pay attention now, this is important. And Jesus marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? I'm sorry, and the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? What's he saying there? He's reading from the Bible. And he's, he's reading it with the Holy Spirit, of course. But he's, 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 he's passing out knowledge and counsel and wisdom that these guys have never heard because the Pharisees of the day don't know the Bible. They don't read the Bible. All their, all their, 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 their righteousness, their, their, what do you call it, piety on upholding the law. All they care about is the law. And they don't care about the Bible. Again, the Pharisees, the, your religious leaders, they're, they're stiff-necked, hard-hearted. They're blockheads. They don't know the scripture. And so these people, these Jews are hearing the scripture for the first time. Apparently the Jews aren't reading the Bible either, even though I just read to you that the Septuagint right here was available to them. All of the Old Testament, all of the prophecies that talk about Jesus' arrival is available to them, but they're not, they're not reading it. Okay, so let's go on here. Um, verse 16, Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but, that, but his that sent me. That means Father God. Okay, this is sound doctrine from God himself, Father God himself. That, that what Jesus is telling them there. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. In other words, if you get into the, if you get into the scriptures, there's going to be a Holy Spirit that comes and teaches you and guides you and counsels you and, and helps you with discernment. He's bringing, he's, he's bringing about the understanding of the Holy Spirit. He's changing everything from law to grace and Holy Spirit filled. Okay, Holy Spirit was not available in the Old Testament. They know maybe a little bit about it, but, but Jesus is saying, you know, when my time comes, the Holy Spirit is available to everybody. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. That's the Pharisees. He's pointing out the Pharisees right there. But he that seeketh his glory, God's glory, okay, his glory, Father God's glory, that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? He's pointing out the Pharisees. He's overturning, he's opposing the Pharisees right here. The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil who goeth about to kill thee. Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye all marveled. Right here, he's referencing um, John 5, the one work he did on the Sabbath. You remember Bethesda Pool? Remember all of those people, 12,000, 14,000 at Bethesda Pool? He, he lasers in and, and, and finds one person. And heals him on the Sabbath because all the Pharisees saw that. That's what he's, that's what he's referencing here. It, everybody marveled at this lame man for 38 years that Jesus just said, pick up your mat and go. That's, that's what's going on here. During this scene, as you will see, the Pharisees are calling Jesus out for healing somebody on the Sabbath. And also ordering somebody to pick up their bed and walk. So that's just so we, we, we're in the same context and we can you know, put ourselves into this time period. All right, John 7, verse 22. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. Do you know what's being said here? Okay, what's being said here is Jesus is pointing out, I healed a man on the Sabbath, and I alone can do that because I am of my father. Now, it is in your law, that you must circumcise a, a newborn on the eighth day. So that means if a newborn is, it, 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 when, a, when a baby is born, at the eighth day falls on a Sabbath, you must still circumcise because that's the Father's will. So you, do you see the contradiction here? What he's saying here is, look, you, you're going to do something on the Sabbath because you have to. You have to circumcise a baby on the Sabbath. And so that is following the Father's will. But they don't understand that. They don't understand what Jesus is saying right here. So, so, they're, so they're so basically full of pride. They can't hear. They have itchy ears, right? They don't have eyes to see and ears to hear. They're so full of themselves that they don't even understand the, the concept that Jesus is giving right here.
Are, are you following me? All right, verse 23. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision that he, the law of Moses, should not be broken, are you angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? That's how I know is the Bethesda pool. Every whit. He made that man whole. All of his body worked. You know, he, 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 it, the way that the scene plays out is he must have had to drag himself around. So he said, I made every whit whole on the Sabbath day. So you, are you following the, the story here correctly? So that's what he's pointing out here. Look, I, I am of the Father. I can do whatever I want. Okay, I'm full of the Father, the Holy Spirit. I healed a man on the Sabbath. And you guys who are not full of the Holy Spirit, you, ha you have to circumcise a baby. Okay, I think I, I, I pounded that home, right? Verse 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Okay, Jesus is saying, don't look at the appearance, look at what's righteous, look at what is good and holy. Judge me on what is good and holy, not on what you, what you, what, what you inter interpret, the appearance, what you interpret. Then says some of them of Jerusalem, is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly. And they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Do the Pharisees, that's the rulers. Do the leader, do the Pharisees, do they understand because of all the prophecies in the Bible that they have? They can't recognize the Christ. So how be it, we know this man, whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth. Whence he is. Verse 28. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and you know whence I am. And I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. Okay, him that sent me is true. Jesus often refers to Father God as true and truth. And so Jesus is saying, You don't even know Father God. You, you, because you don't, you're not in the scripture. And Jesus says in verse 29, But I know him, for I am from him. He has sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. Many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ comes, will he do more miracles than these which this man has done? See, they're confused. They're questioning. Wait, we've seen the miracles this guy does. Does Christ do more than this? They understand he's a prophet, but you, you, you see, there's, there's questioning going on. This is a good thing. Okay, this is good. The Jews are kind of questioning. Verse 32, the Pharisees heard that the people murmured, complained. Such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. So they're wanting to arrest him now. Then said Jesus unto them, yet a little while am I with you. And then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, you shall not find me where I am, ye cannot come. Then said Jews among themselves, Whether will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles? Unto the Gentiles? So they're wondering. They're not quite understanding. Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm going to die. I'm going to resurrect. Where I'm going, you cannot come unless you're of the Holy Spirit. But they don't understand. They're saying, oh, well, now He's going to leave the Jews. He's going to go into the Gentiles. Right? They're just, they, they, Ah, blockheads, whatever. Verse 36, what manner of saying is this that he said, ye shall seek me and shall not find me. And where am I? Tither ye cannot come. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood, cried and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Here he's teaching a concept of the Holy Spirit, the living waters that only Jesus Christ can give you. Okay, only the Trinity of God can give you. So he's saying, if, if, if you believe in me, you know, and you understand, and you accept, I and the Father are one, we will give you the Holy Spirit. So here he's, he's again, he's trying to break down this, this, this con. the only thing they understand is the law. And Jesus is getting rid of it. He's overturning it. He's opposing it. Verse 38, he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And it's in Isaiah, it's in Acts. You can find the Holy Spirit around here. You just under, you got to understand. 
The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is the living waters, the, 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 um, the springs, the bread of life. You just got to understand how the Holy Spirit is referenced here. But they don't. Um, verse 39, but this spake he of the spirit, which they believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus had not yet glorified. He's, he's teaching the, the Holy Ghost is coming. Okay. It's going to come. It comes in Acts. The Holy Ghost is coming as soon as I fulfill my time here. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this say, instead of a, of a truth, this is the prophet. Verse 41, others said, this is Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ come out of the seed of David, out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? And the officer answered, Never man spake like this man. No one's ever spoke like Jesus. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are you also deceived? Have any other rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? That this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he does? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went into his house. Do you see the division? I hope I set the scene so you kind of understand. This is this is the scene that's happening now. The division, the the accusations, um, the church leaders just blockheads. Nobody's in their scriptures. You want to be in the rapture. Trust me, the last seven years are not going to be fun. And all God's people said, Amen.